This recording is for our chapters three and chapter 10. Both of these are uh, subject matter that you have previously studied. I will mention now there are lots of pictures here and um, this is probably not suitable for young children to be viewing unless you want them to have a anatomy and physiology of the reproductive system lesson. So let's go ahead and get started. When we're talking about our anatomy, uh, the components we're going to be focusing on specifically for the female are the reproductive cells, which are eggs or ova, and the organs for the development of the fetus, um, which is the uterus. When you're talking about male reproductive system, you're talking about sperm and the organ that deposits the sperm, which is the penis. So pictures are coming. Just to make sure everyone is on the same page with our female reproductive organs, um, every woman is going to look a little bit different even though most of them have the same parts. Um, here I just wanna make sure everyone understands where things are. The clitoris is usually up in this area and sometimes in order to put a Foley catheter in, you're looking for the urethra and you have to um, kind of open the labia and look for that, especially in a woman that has excess blood volume from pregnancy um, or from being obese, they will have excess tissue there. And so then you also have the vagina opening here and the anus here. So everyone's on the same page. Many times your patients will actually ask you how you're going to be able to put the Foley catheter in because um, many people are unaware of their um, anatomy. So when you are um, getting ready to put your Foley's in, again, it's muscle memory, getting ready to do the actual procedure, but it's kind of figuring it out for each individual patient because they are all a little bit different. And just to make sure everyone is on the same page, you're looking at a cutout view. You have the urethra, which goes to the bladder. That's where we would put a Foley catheter. You have the vagina, which goes to the uterus. This is where the fetus will grow. And then you have the anus, which goes to the rectum, which is the bowel, and that is where stool comes out. This is just a cutaway of looking at the um, uterus. And then over to the each side, you have fallopian tubes and ovaries. It looks in these pictures like they're attached, but interestingly enough, they're not. If you get the opportunity to see a cesarean section, take a look in there um, when they're doing that surgery and you can see that it is not exactly like the pictures. The other important part to know here about the uterus is that it is made up of three layers. And when we do a cesarean section, we cut through all of those layers. So um, one of the reasons that we are extra cautious if a woman is having a, a vaginal birth after a cesarean is because she's had a cut all the way through the uterus. Um, other times that we cut through the uterus is if there's been um, tumors, fibroid tumors, or anything else that's had to be removed, and that can weaken that muscle. So looking at the internal female reproductive organs, you're talking about the vagina, the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. And here's just another cutaway picture to make sure everyone's on the same page. Urethra is here, goes to the bladder. Vagina is here, goes to the uterus. Anus is here, goes to the rectum. And then here are those layers of the uterine wall, as I already mentioned, endometrium, myometrium, which is in the middle, it's how I remember that one, and perimetrium, which is the outermost layer. Your breasts are also part of our um, sexual and reproductive organs. That's what they're for. They're for, um, in America, we use them as part of our sexual response, but also um, we, they are meant for feeding babies. So to look at these glands, this is a nice picture that shows there's a lot of um, uh, pieces and parts to this breast. You have the nipple, the areola, which contains several oil glands to help keep that area soft. You have the lobes here, and then you'll have alveoli that comes to the back and lymph nodes up here. The milk is actually made in this area and needs to be brought down these ducts and out the nipple. The nipple is just the conduit to get the milk out. It is not, it really doesn't have anything to do with um, milk production. 
the size of your breast will have no bearing on um, the amount of milk that a woman makes. So again, here you have um, areola, you have the fat tissue, these are the um, nipple, it has multiple openings, and then your milk ducts and your milk sinuses, your milk producing glands, they're way in the back of the breast. And this is a nice picture looking at um, women that have had breast augmentation. There's two ways that it can be done. It can either go on top of the muscle, usually that's cut right here into the breast it, to place the um, implant, or it can go behind the muscle and, and usually they go up underneath the woman's arm in order to place this sort of implant. Both of these can affect breastfeeding. If you have a breast augmentation, augmentation it doesn't mean that you cannot breastfeed it what it means is that you need to be followed by a breastfeeding specialist a lactation consultant or a lactation educator when you are breastfeeding um, because we need to watch the baby's weight so the way that this can uh, affect it is if it's this type that's placed through here it cuts through all these ducts which is what brings the milk out and if it's the type that's placed underneath the muscle it can actually cut the nerve that's sending the message to the pituitary gland to make milk. And that is what I wanted to review on chapter three. Now we're gonna move on to chapter 10. There's a couple of um, specific things that I wanted to make sure that we covered. Uh, we could spend an entire class just talking about a woman's fertility cycle, so I'm not going to do that, but just very quickly, uh, there is an ovary that, produces an egg that's a whole process and a whole, um, uh, uh, like I said, another class that we could cover that part. That egg is released, it's brought into the fallopian tube, and then it starts its journey down this direction. If at some point a sperm reaches the egg and the egg accepts that sperm, then it becomes what we call fertilized. And fertilization typically takes place somewhere in the tube and then that ovum will start moving, moving, moving um, uh, uh, down and implant into the uterus. If the implantation does not happen, then the woman is not pregnant. If implantation happens, then now we have a growing fetus. And this is just another picture of um, uterus inside the woman's body and then an ovum that has been fertilized that has moved down into the uterus. And we hope that it sets up somewhere in this upper third, up in, up in the fundus, but doesn't always happen that way. The functions of the placenta. The placenta is the organ that the, that is, um, the baby essentially grows as that embryo and fetus start to develop. They will grow the placenta and it serves as the interface between the mother and the fetus. So it keeps things from going in and keeps things from coming out, as well as provides um, uh, nutrition. It's the site of nutrition exchange, gas exchange. It takes waste products back from the baby. It does protect against some viruses, not all. In fact, we'll be talking about that quite a bit. And um, it protects the fetus from an immune attack by the mother. Sometimes the mother's body um, will react as if the pregnancy is a um, foreign object. And it, is, uh, it controls hormones that tells the woman to stay pregnant. So the placenta is a very essential organ. And there's a lot of folklore and a lot of current interest in the placenta and we will talk more about that as uh, we move along in the course but just know that it does serve the purpose of all all of these things making hormones protecting the fetus from some things it will keep some medications and some viruses and some teratogens things that cause issue with the baby um, out but not all it's the energy and gas exchange and it does remove waste product products from the fetus it's so, uh, produces HCG, which is the human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. That's the what we're looking for when we're doing a pregnancy test. It also produces these other hormones, the human placental lactogen. It produces a large amount of estrogen and progesterone, and this is how it tells your body, um, don't produce any more eggs, we're growing this fetus, we, we can't lose the lining of the uterus right now. And it also produces relaxin, which is the hormone that helps to start working on the um, joints 
and allowing the hip joints to loosen a little bit and relax. That's why women kind of get that waddling gait. You can tell that they're pregnant from behind. It um, also usually works on women's feet. Sometimes you'll see women will gain a, a shoe size or more with their pregnancy. But this is the important part is it produces these hormones. And I bring this up here because as I mentioned, um, everyone is so interested in the placenta and there's been a lot of um, media attention and um, uh, the, the stars like to uh, talk about how they're eating their placenta. And one of the, the big benefits that uh, pro, people that are pro placenta eating, it's called um, placentophagy, uh, will tell you is that it produces tons of breast milk. Well, it's interesting because that goes completely against physiology as we know it. So estrogen is the hormone that is produced by the placenta, and it is directly inversely related to prolactin. Prolactin is the hormone of breast milk. That is what causes the milk to be made. And so estrogen suppresses prolactin until the placenta comes off the wall of the uterus and goes away, and that large amount of estrogen is not there anymore, and then prolactin increases, and that's why we see that milk production um, slowly increase over the first week or two. So the fact that you would eat a, a organ that is full of estrogen makes no sense in producing large amounts of breast milk. The other um, benefit that is purported by uh, people that are um, pro placentophagy is that it reduces um, depression. Well, estrogen is the hormone that makes us feel good. It's the one that makes us um, makes our skin soft and makes us feel uh, female, for lack of a better description. And so it can assist, I imagine, with some of that hormone shift that we're feeling after pregnancy. It can assist with the um, little bit of the baby blues, but it is really not possible to fix postpartum depression with a large amount of estrogen. Women may feel better and that's what they're perceiving as keeping them from getting postpartum depression, but postpartum depression is a chemical imbalance and postpartum psychosis goes even beyond that. And it cannot be fixed with a little bit of estrogen. If that were the case, then we would have no issues with women. So just a little bit, there's actually some information that I've put in your more resources um, about some evidence uh, or lack thereof uh, about eating placentas. So now you'll have some good solid information to be able to give to your patients when they ask you about this or your friends. This is a nice picture of um, a baby being born what we call in call. And this was a C-section and this baby was born in the sack and it's just got a great visual of how this fetus was living inside. Of course, they will have to open the sack and let this baby breathe now because the placenta is going to be removed from the mom and there will be no way for this baby to continue getting the oxygen exchange this way. And again, this is um, the, uh, I jumped ahead and talked about it before I got to this slide, but there's some uh, additional resources, like I said, there's some evidence that I've posted and the CDC has come out with a bulletin that said, we cannot recommend um, this because we know that if there is any sort of bacteria in that placenta, we are introducing it back into the mother's body. And there have actually been babies that have um, gotten sick with late onset group B strep, GBS, and, from, and they've directly tied it to um, placenta eating. So talking about the umbilical cord, it's an interesting um, little part of that organ as well. It's the lifeline. It contains one large vein and two small arteries. I remember that AVA, A-V-A, -A, so two arteries, one vein. And then it is filled with this Wharton's jelly. That's what keeps it from being compressed. This Wharton's jelly starts to harden as soon as it touches the air. So this is why it will eventually fall off, uh, dry up and fall off after the baby's born. It's somewhere between 
22 inches long. It can be an inch wide. You'll see short cords. You'll see fat cords. You'll see long cords. You'll see thin cords. Sometimes they're related to the disease processes. And we will talk more about that as we go through this course. But what's important to know is that inside this cord, this big fat vein that you see here, it carries oxygenated blood to the baby. It's different than every other part of our body. Normally in an artery, we have oxygenated blood and in veins, we have deoxygenated blood and waste products. But in the fetus, in the umbilical cord, it's, it's the exact opposite. So all the, everything going towards the baby goes in the vein. So everything oxygenated, all nutrients, um, any antibodies that's going to be passed on to the baby from the mother is going to go in to the baby from the vein and everything coming away from the baby back to the mother is going to be in those two arteries. Important information to know. Everyone's in love with their placenta and their umbilical cord, just a picture here. And then the role of our amniotic fluid is it does a lot of things for these babies. This is a very young fetus under three months. This is an older fetus. Um, it does, uh, the, the, the purpose of the amniotic fluid is it helps to maintain a constant body temperature. Fetuses are about one degree higher than the mothers. So this is one of the reasons that we don't want them to get fevers or we wanna control their fever if they get it. And we certainly don't want to um, encourage hot showers or, um, uh, hot tubs or anything like that because that will make our fetus too hot. By having that amniotic fluid in there, it allows that baby to move around and grow and develop and practice using those muscles and practice the breathing um, motion. They breathe in and out a lot of that amniotic fluid. It cushions them, cushions them from trauma. It keeps the umbilical cord hopefully free of compression, and then um, promotes fetal movement, like I said, for that musculoskeletal development. So the amniotic fluid is very important. There are several conditions that will make too much amniotic fluid or too little. Hydrominose is amniotic fluid. So if we have too much, we call it poly. If we have it too little, we call it oligohydrominose. So um, we will talk more about that as we go through the course, but just know that uh, the, the amount of amniotic fluid we have is important. In the early trimester, we have about 30 mLs. That's about the size of a urine cup. And at term, we have somewhere about a liter. It does fluctuate based on how hydrated the mother is, but um, these are normal amounts, about a liter uh, in the third trimester and about um, uh, 30 mLs or so in those early trimesters. Here's another picture of that big fat umbilical vein and two arteries. Hopefully you'll get the opportunity to see that when you're in clinic. Fetal circulation is different as I've already explained. Um, there are three shunts that are happening inside the fetus that have to close up after the umbilical cord is no longer um, functioning once the placenta has been um, once it's come off the wall of the uterus and the baby has been born. So these are your ductus venosus, ductus arteriosus, and foramen ovale. These are important because a lot of our congenital heart defects will be surrounding these three um, areas. And so here's another picture of where these areas are. This foramen ovale keeps the blood from circulating through the lungs when the baby is a fetus. There's no reason for it to circulate through the lungs because it's getting everything it needs in that large vein from the mother. The um, ductus arteriosus is here. And again, it's part of what is um, helping that blood to be uh, shunted away from the lungs because it's not necessary. And then our ductus venosus is also um, really bypassing that liver. It isn't necessary for the baby to digest anything. So all the nutrients come through and are put right into the baby's bloodstream through the placenta. So again, the placenta is super important um, for the fetus development. Again, with genetics, we could spend an entire course talking about embryology and genetics, but I just very quickly, briefly want to review what we know. Um, when we are talking about our genes, we are talking about our, um, the, the 
copies that we get from our mother and our father, and they make up these base pairs in our DNA. And that is what is the building block of all of our cells, the building block of all of our, everything that, that we possess, our, everything from our hair color, they're looking now even at personality, likes, dislikes, and our um, uh, health and, and our propensity to develop certain diseases. So there's lots of research going on with our genetics right now. They're looking at um, genetic influences on pharmacological therapy. Um, that we've been looking at genes. It's been part of our uh, prenatal care for decades. We have the ability to do some gene testing and some even some gene therapy. I have already talked about CRISPR and how we can now edit these genes. So what that means is we can take out, let's say this gene was faulty, we could take this out and, in, and using CRISPR add in a new portion um, if this copy wasn't correct. So it's very interesting where we're going. I think in, in the next 20 years, this is just an exploding field. So in um, the 1990s, they actually were able to map the entire genome, but they don't know exactly what every part does. So they're still finding different uh, portions and parts of genes that are responsible for certain um, disease processes. So when you're talking about a genome, that's the person's genetic blueprint and your genotype is the genes that you inherit from your parents and your phenotype is what is outwardly observed. These are your characteristics that are outwardly observed. So just to refresh, we, get, we have a total of 46 chromosomes, which are in pairs, 23 pairs and we get one copy from each parent. So in our number one here, we'd get one copy from mom, one copy from dad, one copy from mom, one copy from dad. And down here, in, we always get an X from our mother. And depending on whether we get an X or a Y from our father will determine if we are male or female. So if you get an X from your father, you are a female. If you get a Y from your father, you are going to be a male. And looking at our traits, this is a really good picture of uh, an example of a phenotype. This child is exhibiting um, traits from both of her parents. And it's very interesting how this works. Some diseases require both copies to be present um, if they're passed on from your parents. So that means both parents would have to give you one of those genes and we call that recessive. And others, uh, other disorders and diseases you only need one copy and we call that dominant. And that's as far as I'm gonna go into that. There are all different things that can happen to our chromosomes because our chromosomes are constantly replicating and, and uh, reproducing themselves. So you can get something called a trisomy where instead of having two copies of one gene, you end up with three. The um, trisomy 21 is a very well-known um, disorder that, that babies are born with. We commonly refer to it as Down syndrome. There's other things that can happen within our genes. There can be deletions, inversions, translocations. There can be sex chromosome abnormalities. So there's lots of different things that can happen. And part of what we are doing in our gene therapy is trying to fix some of those things. So it's very interesting. Again, that could be an entire another course, but that's uh, as much as I'm going to um, spin there. And then here are some specific um, uh, um, markers that you might see with uh, trisomy 21. So as I mentioned, trisomy 21, on your 21st gene, you would have three copies versus two. And when this happens, um, every, gene, every cell in that baby's body now has a, has a third copy on the 21st um, area. So we see some specific characteristics. And what we usually say is we see some characteristics that are consistent with Down syndrome. So here you, they sometimes have a flat nose, their eyes may be a little slanted. Sometimes you'll see a, um, what we call a, a simian crease. This is a very good picture of a simian crease. Some people have this and do not have Down syndrome, but it's pretty common with our babies that have 
Down syndrome, and they typically have a very large protruding tongue. It is not up to the nurse to diagnose this. If we see markers that are consistent with Down syndrome, we of course would let the pediatrician know. They will have to send off genetic um, chromosome markers if they were unaware, if this was a surprise, and the, those take several weeks to come back. But the pediatrician is the person that will discuss this with the family. So that's all I have for you today. Um, short little review. Uh, if you have any questions, you know where to reach me.